and um, I help run the Community Mushroom Educator Program, um, uh, which we'll hear all about um, a little bit during this presentation. We're very proud of our CMEs, we call them, Community Mushroom Educators, and all the work that they've done. Um, so yeah, excited to, to be part of this presentation. Thank you. And I just realized I didn't start the recording until now. So that was Yolanda Gonzalez from Cornell Small Farm Cornell Extension. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're going to have a presentation by Quasi Asante uh, from Eco City Farms about mushroom production. Would you uh, please introduce yourself again and, and take it away? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Quasi Asante, as you just heard. Uh, I am a coordinator for the Beginning Urban Farmers Training Program with Eco City Farms. Uh, I've been so for the last two years. I also work part-time at a clinical microbiology laboratory with the University of Maryland uh, by the airport. Um, so my interest in microbiology is what informs my uh, affinity for mycology. <laughs> Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank Neve, uh, as you all know, uh, from the Baltimore Extension Office, and also the, uh, the great guys at the uh, Cornell Small Farms for their help, uh, especially Yolanda. Um, I also want to, you know, thank the uh, all the other sponsors, including USDA, for making this, you know, possible. So, uh, the topic of fungi under which my mushroom falls is a very extensive subject. Uh, however, for the purpose of this workshop, I am going to be focusing on how to grow mushrooms from scratch. Uh, I have organized my, my workshop today, you know, accordingly to accomplish this task. Please feel free to insert questions in the uh, chat box during the talk and I'll be sure to address them at the end. In the most basic terms, mushrooms are fungi. <laughs> that might sound too simplistic but that's that's what it is uh, while you may find many descriptive scientific terms for the purpose of this talk i will be referring to the fruiting part of the fungi as mushrooms uh, as you can see in the images up there um, that's what i'll be talking about there are about fifty thousand actually over 50,000 varieties of mushrooms. The four most common mushrooms found in the United States, in the grocery stores and around as everywhere, you know, if, you, if you're a farmer, uh, are the white button, the oyster, the shiitake, and the lion's mane mushrooms. But today I am going to focus uh, just on the oyster mushrooms for the sake of time. So you may ask, why oyster mushrooms? Well, they are easy to grow. The incubation period for oyster mushrooms are very short. They're shorter than other varieties. They are very delicious and economically viable too. The media for growing them, such as logs, wood, straws, and even sawdust are easy to source. Uh, for the most part, these are also the same uh, media you need to grow other mushrooms. Uh, and must I say again, the oyster mushrooms are commercially viable, especially for you small farmers trying to uh, find some little add-on alternative to your farm. But first, we need to discuss the very basics of how to set your mushroom, uh, your oyster mushrooms up. Uh, mushroom growers rely on, 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 on the media uh, to be able to grow mushroom. Uh, 
there's nothing very particular about the media you need to grow your oyster mushrooms. Uh, as mentioned earlier, logs, straws, wood chips, and sawdust are all good media for uh, cultivating oyster mushrooms. However, I will be, uh, for the purpose of this talk and the time that I have, I will focus on growing them on straw. Straw can be wheat, barley, or rye. And all varieties are easily available. You can source them very easily. You can purchase it from any hardware store. Uh, most farm stands will have them for sale. You can purchase it from sometimes even your next door neighbor <laughs> if you're in the farm country. You want to be sure to buy dry and high quality straw without any seeds in them. Uh, high quality straws will have a very golden yellow color. It should also have a fresh smell with no uh, moldy odor. Moldy or musky, musty uh, straw will not be suitable for mushroom cultivation. Also be sure to ask if you are buying from uh, a farmer or someone, you know, like I said, a, a next door farmer, uh, you be sure to ask if they sprayed any fungicide on the, on the, uh, on the straw before it was harvested from the field. Because this will mitigate the proficient growth of your mushroom. The next step is to choose your oyster mushroom spawn. Spawn is the fungal tissue, uh, kind of like uh, the fruit or the seeds of the, uh, the the seeds of the fruit, if you will, and it's called mycelium. It is similar to the white stuff you see in the image on the left of the panel. Fungal tissues need to grow in a sterile media for generation and to avoid contamination with other unwanted microorganisms. You can purchase mycelium or cultivate it yourself. If you choose to cultivate it yourself, there are many mushroom courses or workshops to teach you the details involving uh, creating your own spawn. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the Cornell uh, Community mushroom educate, educators program that I, we just spoke about. If you choose to purchase, it will likely come to you in, you know, two forms, no more, sawdust or grain spawn. Sawdust spawn is the least expensive and widely available as well. Um, it is easy to use for inoculation. Sawdust inoculation is quick and easy and can be done on a large scale. Grain spawn, on the other hand, uh, comes in the rye or millet grain. It is also affordable, however, slightly more expensive than sawdust spawn. Uh, grain spawn is, grain spawn is also easy to use and the preferred spawn for uh, those commercial producers. You may also, buy a ready to fruit kit. They are a bit more costly, but ideal and are often recommended for first time growers. The first time I tried mushroom, that's the kind I used. And uh, it, it, it kind of kicks in your motivation when you know you do it well and it start growing, you see some mushrooms, you get motivated and you move on to do some, some something bigger. The mushroom spawn will come ready to be inoculated. Uh, in this case, uh, as I said, I recommend uh, doing the uh, sawdust spawn. So the next step is to treat the bale of straw. You will do so by soaking it in water. This is called treatment. Uh, you are treating it to kill other microorganisms that might compete or harm your colony eventually. Uh, to do so, you will need a, a big container 
uh, filled with water. Uh, you drop your bill in there and uh, make sure it is submerged fully in the water by uh, putting some weight on it. Uh, you will leave it in there for approximately 10 days. Some people, you know, suggest shorter time. Uh, you will then take it out and let it sit for about 12 to 24 hours for all the excess water to drain out to the point where it is still moist, but not uh, dry. The next step at this time will be to inoculate the straw or introduce the mycelium, the oyster mycelium into the bill, which is also, can also be called substrate. The bill will be called a substrate. You know? And this time you want to wash your hands very well. Um, and if you will, you may also wear gloves to prevent any microorganisms contaminating this process from your hand. You can use a household, any household tool like a clean broomstick or a handle of a spatula to create holes four to six inches apart and about six inches deep into the bales. Approximately about one liter of spawn will be used for one bale of straw. You will then fill these holes with the spawn deep into the bottom, but you will not fill it all the way. You will fill it to the brim. Uh, you will use additional straw to plug in these holes so that the spawn are covered. You will then store it in a cool, shady place outside if you're growing outside or keep them indoor in the garage or a basement, the cool but moist place. Do make sure that the bale of straw is always moist and never dries up. It is important that it stays moist but not oversaturated with water. Mycelia, mycelia colonies don't do very well uh, when they are dry. So you will want to uh, ensure that you, you know, spray it with water. Like I said, don't oversaturate it, but don't leave it dry. You want it moist all the time. Ideally, the incubation period will last from three to four weeks when the spawn will fully colonize the bale of straw. It should be kept around 75 to 77 degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit and preferably, uh, preferably about 60 to 70 percent humidity if you are able to ensure that. Within six weeks or so you will begin to see the fruiting of the mushroom similar to the image shown here and that's where your motivation kicks in and you get excited all about your know, mushroom. Um, some mushroom growers uh, when it come to, comes to harvesting, some prefer to harvest when the calves are not fully open, as can be seen in the uh, image to the right. Others wait until the oyster mushroom is fully flattened. It depends on the preference of you, the grower. At any rate, you should harvest a mushroom when they get to a stage as similar to these images you see out here. But for the most part, you will find your own sweet spot when you start getting involved in mushrooms. Some of you might be interested to hear a bit about the other common media used to grow oyster mushroom. Uh, I'll talk about logs at this point. Mm -hmm. You may obtain them from a lumber store uh, or from your, uh, your city or towns, um, you know, uh, 
guys who take care of trees, cut trees. Sometimes I would see guys driving down the road and I'll ask them, hey, yeah, can I have a couple of those for my mushrooms? And most of them will be willing to give you uh, a logo too. Oyster mushrooms do very well on maple trees, uh, uh, on maple logs, on oak or birch. Mm. Unlike with a bale of straw, you would need a bit more equipment, like a bit, uh, a drill bit and a drill uh, after you've obtained the logs, uh, you drill a hole in them and you use a plunger to fill your holes up and place them in a cool, damp place, just like you would do with it. Uh, you would do with the straws as discussed above and uh, make sure that they are moist. You will, according to some uh, experts, you do very well with logs that have been harvested in the late winter and early spring, because at this point, the tree has utilized a lot of its uh, sugar. And that's the preferable uh, log that you want to use for your mushroom. It does very well with that. I have to read a little bit more to understand that very well. You can uh, cover your uh, logs with top or you can periodically spray them with, a, uh, with water hose. Um, when you have inoculated your hole, uh, your, after you've made the holes and you know, inoculated them with your uh, spawn, you have to seal them with uh, beeswax. Some people use other things, but beeswax is what I have uh, actually worked with and know about. So you seal them with melted uh, beeswax and place them uh, in a moist place and wait for them to uh, start fruiting. Um, some people with experience uh, are saying that it takes a little longer for you to get the mushroom fruiting with logs than you will with your, uh, with your uh, straw. I don't know how true that is, but uh, that's what I have here. So with that, I think I don't have a lot of time left. So with this time left, uh, let me take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, Cornell Small great. Farm Mushroom Education Program. I can say enough about it. I have learned a lot. Uh, it's a place with, uh, with guys with uh, you know, all kinds of knowledge you need to you know, do mushrooms. Uh, you can find them on the internet. And now we'll also, uh, maybe Neve will share the, uh, the uh, link so that you guys can have access to it, look into it. And if you can, please take the, do the program. It is great, I enjoyed it. I'm still learning from them. And I was fortunate enough to benefit from the expertise of many uh, including basically, you know, starting your own, uh, creating your own mycelium and all that stuff. So it, it, it is, it is really uh, an opportunity for everyone to try. Uh, I think you guys have had enough from me. So I think I will go on to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you. Thank you, Kwesi. That was wonderful. I especially appreciated all of the good pictures. Um, yes. And we had a, a nice long discussion in the chat about vomitoxin on straw. So don't get too distracted by that. I think that the main <laughs> question yeah. was um, if it matters how the straw was treated when it was grown, if it was ever treated with a fungicide when the, the hay was being grown, will that affect the ability to use the straw to grow mushrooms? Well, yes, to some extent. Uh, however, uh, I have also uh, read others talk about if you soaked it in uh, hot water, for instance, uh, it helps, you know, straws usually come looking kind of waxy. 
it helps with you know getting rid of that, but that might also uh, help to maybe uh, help with the decomposition of the uh, whatever was sprayed on it, especially if you decant the water and, and fill it with some more, it might help to mitigate some of the uh, problems that might cause for your growing. That makes sense that it would help break stuff down. Yolanda, did you have anything to add on that question too? Um, no, I would just say, I would just ask wherever you're sourcing it from, what kind of treatment it is and and just generally try to avoid untreated straw if you can. Um, I had a question though. Uh, I know that you mentioned treating the straw. How did you go about doing that again? I didn't catch, I know that I saw the, the bin that you put it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically uh, submerging it in water. Uh, I have seen others talk about uh, treating them with lime and, and other things, but you know, I just wanted to focus on the on the simple, basic way of dealing with it. You know, if you are beginning to uh, start growing, I don't think you want to invest money in something you don't know what you're doing. So mm -hmm. just fill the top with water, submerge mm -hmm. it in there for uh, 10 days. And uh, according to a guy from Germany, uh, mm -hmm. wrote, wrote a book and uh, and last name is Welch, W U. R T H. Uh, he and his wife have been growing for over 35 years. Says if you submerge it in water for 10 days, mm -hmm. it will most likely kill any other uh, organisms that might compete with your mushroom. Yeah, we call it the stinky straw method. Um, it's just everyone's preference is different. On um, some urban farms, it could be something that kind of turns people off, but it's definitely the most low tech, easy way to go. So yeah, I recommend it for beginners. Yeah, I also found the water uh, after that, you know, if you have the ability to make a compost tea mm -hmm. and you, you know, uh, for some of us with, you know, other things to grow, if you put that water in your compost tea and, you know, introduce some oxygen in there, uh, that's very well on the field. Mm -hmm. with your vegetables yeah uh, speaking of vegetables we had a question about nutrition nutritional benefits of mushrooms okay. um i i always say that mushrooms are the urban protein and that you know they're a really great alternative for protein source for vegetarians and vegans and um yeah that's that's my knowledge yes. on nutritional benefits yeah, so yeah, uh, mushrooms are becoming uh, uh, big with many vegetarians, but also with people who are becoming environmentally conscious. Uh, when my uh, two kids, my uh, 12 and nine year old, we read a book and it was talking about uh, cow farting, you know, heating up the environment, you know, we started talking about eating mushrooms, you know, a substitute for eating anything meat, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So, um, yeah, the protein and even the medicinal benefits of mushrooms. Uh, I was reading an abstract just, you know, last night uh, when I was working at the, uh, at the laboratory uh, and I had some time on my hand and they was talking about research into using extract from some of the mushrooms they are discovering in especially the tropical uh, environments that can uh, kill cancer cells. Mm. It's an ongoing study. So the nutritional benefits of mushroom cannot be emphasized. It, it's becoming really um, very well studied and well uh, financed as well. People, private companies, pharmaceutical companies are uh, uh, putting money into it. We know that uh, mushrooms are now being used to treat uh, uh, depression, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They are a good source of vitamin D, which I know is very important for, for mood disorders. Mm -hmm. I see another question. Marcia asks um, how you grow your mushroom now and um, if if it's possible to grow them in the fall and winter seasons, how you would do that? Yeah, so um, it depends on uh, which 
kind of mushrooms you're trying to grow. Uh, some mushrooms prefer, uh, in fact, if you're growing shiitake, for instance, it prefer a cold uh, period for it to uh, really, you know, somebody in fact says to get your uh, shiitake to fruit, you have to soak your logs in the cold water for overnight. And so the period for which you grow the mushroom um, will be determined by what kind of mushroom you're growing. And you can find out a lot more about that uh, from many sources, especially the uh, Cornell University CME program will teach you all that. Mm -hmm. It is possible to grow mushrooms indoors as well. I think some of the pictures you showed were outdoors. So I, I like that about mushrooms that it, it lends itself well to a small outdoor farm as well as an indoor production if you don't have outdoor space. Um, I know Correct, yes. Yeah, so uh, in fact, I'm actually trying, I'm trying both of that right now. I have a little, um, lion's mane ready to fruit and it's indoors in the basement uh, where I'm, I'm trying to, you know, at, at the same time trying it outside to see which one does better uh, where and, and, you know, so it's my own little experiment. So yes, you are able Very to grow cool. it in your garage, in your basement, uh, uh, even in your in part of your bedroom, if you will, especially for those who live in small spaces. Very cool. Um, I see. Uh, go ahead, Yolan. Feel free to elaborate and you can all answer them together too. Oh, I just see that there are two questions about um, using the, the substrates. One about you, the straw bale you can only use once is the question. And the other is um, with the, the logs, do you only use the log once or can you, does the mushrooms come back for multiple seasons? Yes, so uh, the, the straw will, will uh, it would de, uh, generate after you know a period of time. So most people prefer the log. The log can uh, you know it can be continuous for about up to five years, depending on which log you get. And so you will continue to get uh, fruiting during a period of time, uh, depending on the mushroom, for a period of about four to five years. So uh, many people prefer using the log. Uh, the straw, however, will uh, uh, degenerate after a period of time. So you have a shorter period of time for the straw than you will for the log. Thank you. And then there was one more question about if you are growing mushrooms indoors, do you need to worry about ventilation? Yes, so mushrooms are plants. Right, and uh, they require carbon dioxide to, uh, to, you know, to keep going. And so, um, yes, you have to, you have to be able to have, uh, so, so I'm growing my, my lion's mane in the, in the container, you know, uh, uh, in the top and I have to drill holes to get oxygen going in at the same time as the, uh, the carbon dioxide that it's generating because I think at a certain concentration of CO2, uh, it can mitigate your growing from what I have read. I haven't really uh, read, read a lot about that, but um, you also want oxygen coming in to kind of reduce the concentration of the CO2 within the growing space. And then there was another question. Um, does the, the substrate that you grow the mushrooms on, does that affect the flavor of the mushrooms? Do you know? That I do not know, but I have um, I read somewhere that uh, if you grew them on a, on a tree that is bitter, you might, you might probably get a taste of that. I'll have to look into that, but I, I don't think I'm, I'm equipped to answer that question at this moment. Thank you. That is, it is fair to say that you don't know. We say that in, in, in extension a lot too. Um, yes. And I know there's a lot of fighting sometimes between the outdoor mushroom growers and the indoor growers where the outdoor growers say, oh no, mine tastes better because I grow it more mm. slowly. And the indoor growers say, no, it's just fine. 
and I don't have any data on that myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so the argument is what, what the adult growers are saying is because they get exposure to sunlight, uh, mm -hmm. we know sun makes uh, vegetables more potent than, you know, vegetables that are grown without sunlight. So that's, that's kind of where some people are trying to make the argument. But um, like I said, I'm just a novice. <laughs> so I wouldn't be able to kind of take any side on any of those issues. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day I'll, I'll get there to be able to articulate my own uh, opinion on that. Stephanie wanted to clarify her question. She was worried um, about spores. I think I'm interpreting maybe she was worried that the mushroom spores might hurt you if you're living with the mushrooms. Is that something we should be worried about? Um, yeah, so some people have uh, talked about allergies and, and, and sporing and all that. Um, I haven't come across anything where someone has uh, suggested that is, is a problem. Many of the, and I'm also, uh, I also know a little bit about clinical mycology or, um, you know, uh, you know, allergies and, and fungi that causes diseases, um, but I've never seen or read anything about mushrooms. I think they're too big to trigger any allergy re allergic reaction at a microscopic level. I'm not sure, but uh, I've never, I've never had anything like that. That it's able to cause uh, problems for you. Yeah, I know a worker is like in a com commercial facility. Mm -hmm. Will definitely wear like proper masks when they're going in. Um, and then if you are, um, if you have some type of setup at home, it will like leave some residue behind. So you just want to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, let's see, we're, we're getting to the end of our meeting time, and I just want to make sure I say thank you both for, for teaching and taking the time. Um, I do want to give a shout out. I, Yolanda Gonzalez is essentially my counterpart, but in New York City, she and her, and her colleague Sam Anderson um, are the urban extension specialists for New York City. So a nice silver lining of having to do this online is that I get to bring in people who I would not have the budget to fly in otherwise, like uh, Yolanda and like Anna and Joshua this earlier today. Um, so, and thank you, Kwesi, for sharing your experience as a grower, um, a local grower from Maryland. I, I really appreciate you taking the time amongst your farming work and your lab work to pull together a presentation based on what you've learned from your practical experience to share with us. That was wonderful. No, thank you all very much for the opportunity. Uh, and I apologize, I'm a little nervous because I'm a novice, but uh, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you very much to both of you. Mm -hmm.